Notice the difference in tone and the frustration of the investigators. Imagine playing through a poker hand where you're holding like the nuts or the second nuts, how you play it, how you extract money. Those plays always look good. You know, you do a little bit of value betting, you got some, you're doing a lot and everything looks good, but you, you've got like, you've got the nuts, the second nuts, like, good job. Wow, you, you were, oh, you're always winning this hand, you know? So the investigators always come up like, here's their advanced tactics, here's this, here's that. Because really the only thing they're trying to do is put together a good story because they already have all the evidence. Now they just need to sell it to a jury. So so they need to get a good story for why the f did you do this? But here, I've known two people that are like this. Um, but I remember one person while I worked at the casino, the reason why is because people that lie like this, they're not actually listening to you. They don't actually give a f about what you're saying. And, and I remember when my conversation with this guy, like he'll like kind of nod along or whatever. I don't know how I could know this. I don't know, this must be like a normal human thing. Her death is undoubtedly the most heartbreaking part of this story, and we only need a single word to epitomize her short life. Tragic. Orlando police received a call from Cindy Anthony, the grandmother of the victim. I cried a little bit ago, the deputy sheriff, I found out my granddaughter has been taken, she has been missing for a month. We're talking about a three-year-old little girl, and she was in a wheelchair. Is your daughter there? Yes. Can I speak with her? They want to talk to you. Can you tell me a little bit what's going on? My daughter's been missing for the last 31 days. And you know who has her? I know who has her. I've tried to contact her. I actually received a phone call today now from a number that is no longer in service. I did get to speak to my daughter for about a moment, about a minute. Who has her? Do you have a name? Her name is Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez. Casey Anthony had left the family home with her daughter a month earlier, stating that she had a work assignment in Tampa and would be traveling the entire time. Kaylee's grandparents would ask repeatedly over the following month to see, or at least speak to their granddaughter, but Casey claimed each and every time that she was too busy with work and that Kaylee was with a nanny who went by the name Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez, or Zanny for short. Exactly six weeks after Kaylee was last seen by her grandparents, George Anthony received a phone call that the family car was at the impound lot. It was the same car Casey had supposedly been traveling with for work. George discovered a strong odor emanating from the trunk, one that he recognized from his years as a police officer and found comparable to that of human decomposition. Her parents managed to track her down at her boyfriend's house in Orlando, where they were found smoking marijuana and watching TV. When inquired over the whereabouts of her daughter, Casey stated that she had been kidnapped 31 days before by the supposed babysitter. Why are you calling now? Why didn't you call 31 days ago? Jesus. I've been looking for her and have gone through other resources to try to find her. Imagine thinking, or maybe this is just me as a parent, imagine thinking your child is missing for 31 days. I remember, I know that different people have different standards in like different countries for when their child walks home, but for me, um, I could, I, I got nervous even imagining Nathan walking home from school because there'd be like, a 15 minute part of his day where he would be completely unaccounted for by any other adults. Like even that like fucked with my head. Or if you like lose your kid in like the grocery store, imagine you just don't know where your kid is for 31 days. I feel like that in and of itself is some insane shit. Now let's indulge in the world of fantasy for just a moment and pretend all of what Casey had just stated was true. She had indeed been working and her daughter was in fact kidnapped by the babysitter a month earlier. The immediate premise most would gather would be that Casey had no regard for her daughter whatsoever. Yeah. In the 911 call, there was no urgency nor concern in her voice, and rather than her volunteering information, which most parents would do in a frantic manner, it had to be acquired by the dispatcher through repeated inquisition. All you have to do is compare Casey's dialogue to that of her mother's in the same phone call. Even without the bizarre phone call, the circumstances alone would make Casey the prime suspect in her daughter's disappearance. Yeah. How long had you known Zenaida? Almost four years. It'll be four years Christmas this year. Okay. And where did you meet her? Who did you meet her through? A mutual friend. His name is Jeffrey Michael Hawkins. I met him at Nickelodeon at Universal, and I met her through him. She does, was his son's nanny at the time. Does Jeffrey still work at uh, Universal? No, he does not. How long has it been since he left? About nine, ten months, give or take. He moved up to North Carolina for a short time and moved down to Jacksonville within the last three months. More or less acquaintances. Weren't very good friends? Not very good friends. 
Did you ever work at Universal Studios? I did. When did you work at Universal Studios? Approximately 2002. How long did you work there for? One year. Did you ever work there at the same time that Casey Anthony worked there? I don't think so. You don't recall ever seeing her there? Never. Did you ever introduce Casey Anthony to a woman by the name of Zenaida Gonzalez? I did not. Did you ever use Zenaida Gonzalez as, as a nanny? No, sir. Do you have any children? No, sir. Uh, have you lived in the Orlando area consistently since 2002? Yes, sir. Have you ever lived in Jacksonville? No, sir. Have you ever lived in North Carolina? No, sir. Did you see Casey Anthony in the month of June of 2008? No, sir. When was the last time you spoke with him? About a week and a half ago. It's been within the last year and a half, two years, that she started watching Kaylee. How would you normally drop off, or how would you normally do the exchange with your child and Zanaya? Would you drop the child off? Would she meet you somewhere? I would usually drop her off for yes. a few months. We would go over to Jeff's house. He lived over in Avalon Park. And you would go to Jeff's house, why? To drop off Kaylee. That's where Zanaya would go to watch both of the kids. Okay. It was in a nice centralized area. He had a decent sized house. It was good room for the two of them. Do you think people spend time putting together stories? If somebody would ask me, like, where were you on, like, June 14th? It's like, I, fuck, I have no idea. I'd have to check my calendar. I don't fucking know. I don't remember where that... Do you, you guys must... I don't know if it's, like... But I guess maybe you take some time to, like, check your story and, like, contact friends or whatever. But, like, sometimes people ask you, like... Or, or people seem like they have really quick responses. But, like, where were you on the night of, like, June 12th? It's like, uh... I don't know. Fuck. Yeah, I don't know. Have you talked to anyone about Kaylee, about your answer to Kaylee? Or the Outside that of she's missing? a couple people, a couple mutual friends. Who did you talk to about um, I talked to Jeff, Jeffrey Hopkins. Mm -hmm. I talked to Juliette Lewis. She's one of my coworkers at Universal. She works, you still work at Universal? Yes. What the, What do you do at Universal? An event coordinator. Okay, what is Juliet? what position is she, where is she works? She's also an event coordinator. We work in the same department. Juliet Lewis doesn't exist. Casey had briefly worked at Universal, but hadn't been employed there for over two years prior to this interview. And she wasn't an event coordinator. She stood behind a kiosk and sold photos of people after they had been on the Incredible Hulk ride. You have a number for Juliet? <laughs> offhand, I can't think of one. She in your SIM card? No, Consultant. Some That's what they sound like, guys. Numbers. Her number just changed because she just moved back up north. She so Juliet doesn't work down. at Universal anymore? No, she does not for the record. What's the reason you didn't call the police before? I think part of me was naive enough to think that I could handle this myself, which obviously I, I couldn't. And I was scared that something would happen to her if I did notify the authorities or after me. Another case of somebody being so stupid. Like, what do you think is going to happen? Although I don't think Casey Anthony was convicted, right? She like walks free. What a horrible lie. What a dog shit lie. 31 days. Be involved. Just the fear of the unknown. Zenaida, the nanny, doesn't exist. Casey never had a babysitter. Being the retrospective viewer, we have the benefit of knowing these are outright fabrications. And these you... meticulous details are a textbook sign of a pathological liar. She speaks eloquently and naturally as if her dialogue is a reflex response to the questions she's being asked. When in reality, each of these minor details are calculated and deliberately placed for the purpose of deception. And the nonchalant, easygoing tone she employs is used to camouflage anxiety. If we go through what we know about Casey's domestic history, there are numerous occasions where she had gotten away with things that most would not. A prime example could be when she was 18 years old and stopped attending class midway through her senior year. She literally skipped the entire second half of her final year to go hang out with her older boyfriend. Her parents became suspicious on several occasions, yet each and every time, Casey had some whimsical excuse. Days before graduation, her parents were informed by the school of her truancy and that she would not be graduating. When confronted, Casey- Was this high school or college? Was this high school? No, they said truancy, so it must be high school. How do you miss so many days and they don't contact the parents? I don't understand. Doesn't that happen after like, isn't there like a maximum number of days, like 17 or 18 days you can miss in a school year before the school starts to contact your parents? That sounds really weird, but because you're like, it's a, it's illegal, I think. Well, it might only be until 17, but yeah. I think after an age, maybe that drops off. I don't know. 
Lucy's excuse was that her timetable was mixed up by the school, causing her to miss classes through no fault of her own. Whether it be through denial or an overprotective nature, Casey's parents not only took her at her word, but even shielded her from the consequences of her actions. They lied to all their family friends that she graduated with honors and even threw her an extravagant graduation party the day after. This is just one of the many occurrences Jesus. where Casey faced no ramifications for misconduct. Casey was asked if she could take police to all places of interest. She happily obliged and then proceeded to lead them to a multitude of fake addresses which she had nothing to do with. She then took them to her supposed office at Universal Studios and literally led three senior investigators to the very end of the building, taking over 25 minutes to walk to, before she finally turned around, put her hands in her back pockets, laughed, and admitted that she didn't work there. Completely dumbfounded, the detectives placed her under arrest. I know, and you know, that everything you told me is a lie, correct? Not everything that I told you. Pretty much everything that you've told me, including where Kaylee is right now. That, I still, I don't know where she is. Sure you do. And here, here's, I absolutely listen, do let me, not let me, know where she let me, is. Let me explain something. Looking at you, I know that everything that you've told me is a lie. I am very confident, just by having talked to you the short period of time, that you know where she is. I legitimately have not seen my daughter in five weeks. I didn't let anything happen to her, except I trusted her with somebody. Somebody that had been taking care of her, that had been taking good care of her. Someone that she was comfortable with, that I was comfortable what about, with. What about Jeff? You said Jeff worked here about, until about two months ago? No, he hasn't worked here for quite a ten while. Ten months? How long? It's been at least ten months. Okay. He got it's fired in 2002. Years. He hasn't been an employee here since 2002. We put a lot more together than I think you realize we put together. My question to you is we're in this office because our purpose in coming here was to do what? I'm trying to think of places no, where I, I know she's <laughs> been. You're not answering help. the question. Do you want us to help? Yes, do you want to help us find your daughter? I do want you. Well, a good starting point would be to answer the questions, okay? If I say to you we're here because, and then you just ignore that like I never asked it, and go off in some other direction, is that answering the question? No. Okay. Well, let's go through this again. We're here because. Because I lied, because I brought you up here, and honestly, it was One thing you can notice in these videos now is that, um, notice the difference in tone and the frustration of the investigators. So one of the things that I said before that is kind of like, okay, yeah, good job, is that like, <clears throat> imagine playing through a poker hand where you're holding like the nuts or the second nuts. There's like a straight, you've got it, or there's a full, you've got like the nut full house, you've got like the best hand, and like how you play it, how you extract money. Those plays always look good. You know, you do a little bit of value betting, you got some high fucking, uh, you know, play, like you're doing like, you're, you're doing a lot and everything looks good, but you, you've got like, you've got the nuts, the second nuts, like, good job. Wow, you, you were, oh, you're always winning this hand, you know? So the investigators always come up like, here's their advanced tactics, here's this, here's that. Because really the only thing they're trying to do is put together a good story because they already have all the evidence. Now they just need to sell it to a jury. So they need to get a good story for why the fuck did you do this? But here, where they have nothing, now it's a lot more fresher. Now they can't play like the cute little games. Now they can't be like, oh, blah, 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 blah. I just want to know it because they have nothing. They have nothing to go on. They don't know anything, right? The amount of frustration that's available here is markedly different than in the other ones where they have all the cards, right? Reaching for No, stop right there. I want you to tell me how lying to us is going to help us find your daughter. It's not going to. Well, then if the main thing you want to do is find your daughter and you don't think lying to us is going to help us find her, why would you do that? Because I'm scared, and I'm, I know I'm running out of options. It's been a month. What are you scared of? I'm scared of not seeing my daughter ever again. I'm a parent, too. I would have been beside myself. I have been. I would have called the police immediately, and that's the part that I just don't understand. Well, I we didn't could, know we've got what so to many do. resources out there that we could help on day one. You didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. At that point, I'm thinking, okay, they haven't been gone that long. Maybe I can find them. Maybe I can track them down. We're, we're not stupid, okay? And what you're doing right now is you're, you're, you're treating us like we're stupid. Everything that's coming out of your mouth is a lie. Yeah. Everything. Either you gave Kaylee to someone and you don't want anyone to find out because you think you're a bad mom, or something happened to Kaylee and Kaylee's buried somewhere or in a trash can somewhere, and you had something to do with it. Either way, right now, it's not a very pretty picture to be painting. You're painting yourself as a very bad person. It needs to end. The truthful thing this is that I have not end. seen my daughter. The last time that I saw her was on the 9th of June. Remember we had those two people that we were talking about, the person who had an accident, and a person who's just a cold-blooded, callous monster? 
That's telling me that you are the second person, this cold-blooded, callous no. monster who doesn't care and doesn't want to help because she's afraid that something so heinous happened that everyone's going to look at her and say, she's a monster, she deserves to go away, she deserves to never see the light of day, this bad thing should happen to her. I don't want to believe that right now, but you're going to give me no choice. Tell us what happened to Kaylee. Tell us what happened to I Kaylee. I dropped off Kaylee. And that's the last time that I've seen her. I dropped her Where off. Where did you drop her off? I dropped her off at that apartment. No, you didn't. That's exactly no, where you I dropped didn't. her off. Did you just think that one day she's just going to show up at your house? No. I sat around yesterday trying to figure out what to do. I'm glad that I ended up seeing my mom, that all of that stuff happened. It happened for a reason. Because You're glad you saw your mom. You could have saw your mom five weeks ago and said, Mom, I don't know where. I saw my mom's reaction right off the bat, and it would have been the same from the get-go. So wait a minute, you're more afraid of your mom's reaction than you are if you ever see your daughter again? No, I'm absolutely petrified. Absolutely petrified. I know my mom will never forgive me. I'm never going to forgive myself. Is it that there's some other thing more important in your life right now that you just weren't really focused on uh, what you were saying when you told us? So you kind of just accidentally told us you had an office here and we needed to be here? Or did you purposely mislead us? <laughs> Which of those two is it? I purposely misled Okay, so you purposely misled us. This was all an attempt to help find your daughter, right? That makes sense to you, correct? In a backward sort of way, yes. In a backward sort I'm of way. I'm coming back to places that are familiar to me, that I know are familiar to her. Familiar situations that what did you think? just maybe How old is she? would help. She's almost three. She's, she's almost three. three. What do you think she's going to take a cab here? I mean, <laughs> I How do you think she's going to get here? Because she's with someone else. She's with someone else who's hid her from you for five weeks. Yes. She's, I'm trying to think, could Nathan <laughs> get anywhere at three years old? What the fuck are you, what, this is, these are horrible lies. Why would a person who has hid your daughter from you for five weeks, okay, bring her to the building that you used to work at I don't know what else to do anymore. If I knew where she was, if something well, happened, this. I would have admitted that do you a long think, time do you ago. Think, do you believe thinking up more lies to tell us will help us? No. She's with someone that I absolutely do not trust, and that I'm absolutely scared. That, that you don't trust yet with babysitting your daughter for a year. I don't now. trust her now. Because <laughs> of what happened. Who did you call first? Who did you go to for help first to help try to find her? Casey was then taken to the county jail where she in the evening hours was able to make a phone call and just happened to see her mother on the local news moments before speaking to her. Hello, I just saw your nice little cameo on TV. Which one? What do you mean which one? Which one? I did four different ones and I don't know, I haven't seen them all. I've only seen one or two so far. You don't know what my involvement is in stuff? Casey. Mom. What? No. I don't know what your involvement is, sweetheart. You can, you're not telling me where she's at. Because I don't f***ing know where she's at. Are you kidding me? Casey, don't waste your call. To no. Scream and holler at waste me. my call sitting in the jail? Well, whose fault is you sitting in the jail? You're blaming me that you're sitting in the jail? Not Blame yourself fault. for telling lies. You mean it's not your fault? What do you mean it's not your fault, sweetheart? If you'd have told them the truth and not lied about everything, they wouldn't... Do me a favor. Just tell me what Tony's number is. I don't want to talk to you right now. I don't have his number. Um, we'll get it from Lee because I know Lee's at the house. Get Tony's number for me. Jeez. Hey. Hey, can you give me Tony's number? I can do that. I don't know what real good it's going to do at this point. Well, I'd like to talk to him anyway. Okay. Because I called to talk to my mother and it's f***ing wait. Oh, by the way, I don't want any of you coming up here when I have my first hearing for Bond and everything else. Like, don't even waste your time coming up here. You're making it real tough for anybody to want to try to... I'm not going around and around with you. That's pretty pointless. Christina would love to talk to you because she thinks that you will tell her what's going on. Frankly, we're going to find out. Everything she's telling them is If I knew where Kaylee was, do you think any of this would be happening? No. Anyway, you only got a couple minutes for this, so I'm not going to let you completely wait. So here's Christina. She thinks she can get through. No, no. I want Tony's number. I'm not talking to anybody else. Hello? Hi, I'm glad everybody's at my house. Do me a favor, get my brother back because I need Tony's number. Do, does Tony have anything to do with Kaylee? No, nothing. Okay, so why do you want to talk to Tony? He's my boyfriend, and I want to actually try to sit and talk to him because I didn't get a chance to talk to him earlier because I got arrested on 
wins today. I just want to talk to Tony and get a little bit of... Uh, Casey, uh, you have to tell me if you know anything about Kaylee. Sweetheart, if anything happens with Kaylee and Casey, I'll die. You understand? I'll die. If anything Hello. happens to that baby. Oh my God. Calling you guys? A waste. Huge waste. Casey Jesus. appeared in the court the next morning and was initially denied bail by the judge. And it would be nine days until she received her first visit from her parents. Hi. Hi, sweetie. You can, we've, been, we've been watching you for so long. You have I love you. I love you too. Hi. <laughs> we've been seeing you sitting down. We, we forgive anything that you've said. Oh, or I, done. Hold, hold on. Can we turn the volume down? Yeah. Can, you can probably hear it. My head's gonna explode. <laughs> What's that t-shirt? I didn't get a chance to ask him, you know, other things. Kaylee's besides. picture's on the back. Is it? Can Dad yes. show me the shirt? Yeah, turn around so you, you can see. It's the hope, Never Lose Hope Foundation. Do you see it? I can see Your part picture. of it, yeah. Have you seen me? And then it has the information on how to contact. Okay. Casey, you don't realize the whole United States is looking for our Kaylee. I know that, Mom. Her cover's going to be on People Magazine in a few days. Having your missing child on the front cover of People Magazine would seem as a godsend to most. Yet Casey's response is almost as if it's a lost cause. Everybody is looking for her. Are we going to be able to find her, do you think? I hope we can, Mom. Setting aside morality and ethics for just a moment, Casey at this point would be emotionally exhausted. Anyone in her position, guilty or otherwise, would be at near breaking point. This is one of the few moments where Casey's true self is on display. Of itself, it's a touching moment between a mother and daughter. Yet if we add in the context of the surrounding elements, she it's is only yikes. expressing this pain for herself. Just a moment ago, when she saw her deceased daughter's face on her father's shirt, none of this emotion came out. Casey's parents try to extract any information they can about Kaylee's possible whereabouts, and each time are essentially dismissed by Casey as if they're asking pointless and irritating questions. Do we have any pictures of Sandy's Mom, apartment? Aline and I already talked about this. I don't okay. know. It could right. be on, on the desk at home. I don't know. What is your... I can't get into your... Um, I gave Lee everything already. I all gave right. Lee all of the passwords, everything we could possibly want to get all over again. I want to get some video clips off Kaylee because the video clip with Grandpa is really helping people. I gave Lee the password. Please look up, sweetheart. I need to see your eyes. I want to be able to look at you guys, too. Every time her parents stop inquiring over the case and show that they still care about Casey herself is when the tears come out. Hey, gorgeous. How you doing? I look like hell. <laughs> well, you know something? You, you really need to keep your spirit high for all this. I have. I haven't been crying while I've been in here. Well, you know something? I've been trying to read books and do other things to keep my mind off of stuff. Well, you know, I want to be able to reach out and hug you and give you the, the you know, the big, the big Papa Joe hug. But, you know, I, 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 we got to get that little girl back any way we can, and we're, and we're Dad, doing everything we can. my only concern. I gave Lee a statement. I want him to speak to whoever in the media, give them a statement specifically from me. He's going to give them an exact quote. Every time Casey's parents mention that people are willing to help with a search, Casey dismisses their credibility and even attacks some of their characters while she's at it. Tara? Tara from Michigan. You mean Mark's psycho ex-wife, Tara? Yes. Listen. People like Tara, people like Jesse, who are maybe trying to help, even Christina, God bless her, don't know what the hell they're talking about. I wish I could have been a better dad and better grandpa, you know? You've been a great dad and you've been the best grandfather. Don't for a second think otherwise. Well, you know, you... and you... Mom have been the best grandparents. Kaylee's been so lucky. Jesus. Kaylee okay, is well... so lucky to have both of you. You've... you've... <laughs> I can't even put into words how glad I am that she's had both of you. And that she still has both of you. We get another glimpse at Casey's skill in fabricating information and her ability to intertwine specific details to afford her lies some credibility. These minor intricacies are what would make her extremely convincing if we didn't happen to know otherwise.
they never searched by her full name. They searched by Zenaida Fernandez, whereas Zenaida Gonzalez never by her full name. I think that for for I don't know if like it's actually a thing that people um, are um, not kleptomaniacs, uh, pathological liars. But uh, I, I've known one. I've known two people that are like this. Um, but I remember one person while I worked at the casino. I feel like there's a difference. There's a di- there must be a different cognitive process when you're making up lies. You're like actively trying to think of things that like kind of make sense. You're trying. It's like you're, you. It's a it's a it's a deliberate process when you're fabricating lies. But I feel like there are some people that just lie about everything. They and and it's it's not so much a process of like. What story do I need to fabricate to like get myself out of this? It's more just like what what does this person want to hear right now, and I'm going to tell them that. It's like it's like a it's like a different it's a totally different mode of operation. Remember, there was this kid at the casino, and he would just lie constantly. He would always one up stories. He would always just tell people like insane shit to like make himself look better. And it was always just like yeah, Cloudy Manex revealed that still the time. It was always, it was like, and, but it didn't seem like he was thinking much. He wasn't like deliberately thinking about like what lie am I going to tell? It was just, like somebody would just be like, oh, like dude, like I was racing. This guy on the street or should I beat him from stuff like stuff like he was driving a Mustang it was awesome and this and he would just be like oh dude I was driving a Honda Accord I beat this guy in a Ferrari right it, that would be like the type of lie that he would tell and like I think after like two days of being with him he'd be like dude what the fuck what the fuck is wrong with you like you're you're so full of shit and they're not even good lies it's just obvious that you're just lying about everything um yeah, I, but I feel like there's like a different mode there. There's a different type of thing between the people that you're just jealousy one that lie like that. Yeah. And I know she went by both last names. She always has since she was younger, since her mom remarried. So I think her her dad's first name is Victor, her stepdad, or that could be her real dad. But I remember her saying Victor. Victor and so Gloria Victor, were her parents. Victor and Gloria are her parents, but they're separated or divorced. They are as of now, yeah. That was her They're stepdad. Divorced. But I know she has a lot of money. That's where she got the car from. I, my, I, fuck, is she in chat? Let me check, hold on. <laughs> I gotta make sure she's not. Okay. I love my mom to death, but I think you could, I think that I could have totally been a kid like this because I feel like my mom is this type of mom where I, you could tell like any lie to her, but she loves her kids so much. It's just like, whatever. She'd be like, okay with it. Um, I think that, I don't know what it is about, these types of parents um I, I i don't know how to explain it like because i remember growing up i would lie to my mom about a lot of dumb shit and she would like almost always believe me um why i'm trying to think why parents would do that it must have been their childhood because when nathan lies to me i it's obvious i can see like you don't want to do this thing and you're just horrible at lying. I understand why you're lying. It's because you want more computer time or you don't want to wash your hands after you go to the bathroom or you don't want to eat some yucky food. I know, I understand why you're lying, but you're a kid, you're so bad at it. It's so obvious when you're lying. But there are some parents that unironically can just be fooled so much. I don't know why. It's so strange. Um, maybe because they didn't lie as kids. That's the only thing I can think of is maybe when they were kids, maybe they never lied to their parents, so they couldn't fathom their child lying to them. That's that would be that would be my guess. My heart, she's not far. I can feel it. Okay. This was perhaps the first time Casey told the truth when speaking of her daughter's whereabouts, as she indeed wasn't that far away. Her attorney, Jose Baez, eventually managed. Aren't they fishing for evidence here? The parents? It sounds like they kind of don't believe her. Maybe, but like everything about the daughter's reaction is just so unfathomable. And they are parents. Like, I just can't imagine any parent being told that your daughter is missing for, um, for fucking a month that you didn't check in at all. Like, I can't imagine the parents thinking that's normal, even no matter how much they love their kid. That's just unfathomable to me. ...to get her bail. And Casey was fitted with an electronic monitoring device and released on August 21st. She had spent just over one month in custody. Two months later, police were granted permission to arrest Casey on the charge of first-degree murder. She was taken in for interrogation, but immediately requested her right to counsel. She was kept in the interview room while awaiting her attorney, and the released footage of that period is so bizarre to the point where it's almost comical. The detectives give off a passive, yet glaringly obvious vibe that lets 
Casey know exactly what they think, being that she is guilty of her daughter's probable death and a fundamentally terrible human being on every imaginable level. Casey's response to this is to essentially ignore it and act as if the discourse between them and the situation itself is an everyday occurrence. The first segment of footage shows the arresting officer waiting with Casey for the lead investigator to arrive. He initiates the conversation by bringing up the subject of Casey's parents. He asserts that he's worried about them, but the actual message he's putting across is that he essentially knows Casey is guilty and that she isn't fooling anyone. It's an indirect yet obvious accusation. I was afraid that some of what I said to them probably offended them because I told them that if I find out something that you don't want to hear, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you why. Well, just honestly, because. they'll respect that. That's just, you know, the yeah. type of people that they are in the same way. I know, I know they are. It was never my intention to piss anybody in your family off. Yeah. You know, I'm not in it to get a conviction. I get nothing out of it. I get zero. Exactly. You have a job you're trying to do. I've, you I've know. found a few, and I've yeah. not found a few, and it sucks both ways. Yeah, I agree. Where I get sideways, sideways with people. Mm -hmm. She continuously provides these sharp interjections to appear as though she's following what the detectives are saying. People will often do this to express concurrence and understanding. It essentially lets the other person know that you understand them, either intellectually or emotionally. That a point they made makes sense to you, or that you get why they feel a certain way about something. The only problem here is that Casey's verbal reciprocation at times makes no sense whatsoever. What's fascinating is that this would go unnoticed in an everyday setting. When recorded on film, however, and able to be studied and scrutinized, it becomes far more distinctive. Where I get sideways, sideways with people mm -hmm. it tends to be when attorneys get involved. I've heard most people say that. They don't like attorneys very much. <laughs> I, have, I have many family members that are attorneys. I have no problems with attorneys. What I have problems with are, at some point, mm -hmm. we have to set aside the rules, and we have to fight kids. And you know what? So be it. That's why I told you in the car. You know, if you tell me anything now, yeah. I'll get up and say, yep, I heard it, and you'd already <laughs> invoked it. We can't use any of it. That's just the way it is. That's all that matters to me. Yeah. The detective here has essentially just asked Casey for the information he knows she has about her missing child. Rather than retaliate and refute the blatant accusation, Casey continues with her sharp responses of accordance as if to say she agrees and knows exactly where the detective is coming from. Yet although she apparently agrees, she offers no information or follow-up dialogue like thereafter. It's so incredibly awkward, yet equally intriguing to watch. Another case that I was involved in. You know, they, they lost a confession. And I sat there and I looked right at the guys that we worked with. I said, That's not what's important. Who cares? Yeah. We found her. We found her and he's going to get what is coming to him. That's not my job. Mm -hmm. You know? And, and it works out in the end. And it works out in the end on all sides, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. It may not be comfortable for everybody. Yeah. And there's, I've done things that if I get caught for, I'm not <laughs> going to be comfortable, I can tell you that. <laughs> it's just the way life is, you know, but it's not the end of the road either. And that's what we have to keep in mind, it's not the end of the road. Casey then casually brings up the topic of the grand jury and the media surrounding her murder trial. She raises the questions as if she's talking about her favorite daytime TV show. Yeah, but, I know. If it, but if the subpoena itself yeah. is just a regular federal yeah, murder, grand jury subpoena, that's public, public records. Yeah. It doesn't say what it's for. It doesn't say what case it's in. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. It just says you're subpoenaed to appear before the grand jury. Well, with them announcing that you know there was going to be a grand jury, and obviously my name was thrown out. They knew who the grand jury was for. Who threw your name out? All of the media said that it was from an inside source meeting in here. So that's where they all say is. I can tell you what I think of the media and what I think of people who leak stuff to the media. I think it's garbage. Yeah. But I agree. <laughs> that's the next thing. That doesn't, way that it, doesn't yeah. make it any less necessary without them. Mm -hmm. She's so accustomed to giving these ungenuine responses at every given opportunity that she doesn't even know where to place them correctly. This response should have been given two seconds earlier when the detective finished his declamation, not when he started a new sentence. It's so incredibly aggravating to watch. Uh, and I think the reason why 
is I'm, I'm generalizing a lot maybe from my own personal experience. The reason why is because people that lie like this, they're not actually listening to you. They don't actually give a fuck about what you're saying. And, and I remember when my conversation with this guy, like he'll like kind of nod along or whatever. I don't know how I could know this. I don't know, this must be like a normal human thing. I don't feel like it's superhuman, but I can tell when I'm talking to somebody if they're paying attention to what I'm saying. I don't know how to express that in words, but I think you can get that feeling when it's like, if I were to ask you to repeat what I just said, you'd have no fucking idea. And it's not its not as obvious as like they're looking on their phone or something like that. It's just sometimes you can tell like somebody's just like not, the, like the lights aren't on or they're not just like listening to what, like you're not comprehending what the fuck I'm saying. And that one compulsive liar guy that I'm thinking of, it was like, he was like that. Like you could tell him like, oh, like I did this. And he's like, mm-hmm, yeah. And he's just like, he's totally not, not even remotely considering anything you're saying. Um, so th th yeah, this isn't surprising either. We don't find a quarter of the kids that we... Oh, I agree. Them. It helps. The exposure has helped bring in so many tips for my daughter. But at the same time, what, mm -hmm. it, re what it creates is it creates a monster that otherwise isn't necessary. Exactly. Uh, the tips are what the tips are. Mm -hmm. If it was a local media only, mm -hmm. it would be much easier to work. Yeah. When you make it the national media, then you come up you with... You get the Nancy Graces. The, well, you get the, well, you get the tips also mm -hmm. that come from Hawaii that say, I saw Caleb. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? <laughs> okay, let me call no, Hawaii and let me send them out. Let me do that. ones that are a little bit closer Th those, are, those are what I consider local because the, yeah. the local it's stations are going to cover that. That's, yeah. that's contiguous to the state of Florida. That's not... When people are only getting their information from the Nancy Graces or from Globe magazine or People or, you know, stuff like that. Are you kidding me? You're not going to break bad, right? No. All right. We're going to call him on my cell phone. Okay. I know this is... Oh, yeah, that's not good. Pull it back there. <laughs> Just slide your hand out. No, I, I, I honestly can't. <laughs> so they're a little tight. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for entertaining us. Just slide your hand out. Where do you go, Corporal Edwards? <laughs> Actually, if I could, I would have done that for you. Do you know Baez's right? phone number off the top of your head? No, I do not. How, how can we get this I was gonna say like we're watching a JCS video, so the the mean thing is that like she actually thinks she's gonna get away with this just because of how coy she acts and everything. But I mean, <laughs> spoiler alert. Imagine you were Casey, but void of any wrongdoing whatsoever. Your daughter was kidnapped five weeks ago, and now a detective who thinks you're the culprit is relaying the agonizing moments of your father providing information for your arrest. No matter how stoic or self-controlled your nature, you would most likely be in tears or completely enraged at the overwhelming unjustness of the situation. You anxious about today at all? Um, I have been. I mean, this is something, honestly, we've been preparing for from the beginning just because of words that were directly spoken from Yuri Malich and also from uh, Sergeant Allen. They were saying that this is what they were planning on doing from the very beginning, from that first I step. feel like I've outpaced So they wrote me off within the first couple hours. That was the only time they ever made any effort to try to talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. And... No, it was kind of difficult. That was kind of difficult considering. Well, considering, um, obviously, in light of everything that's going on and the fact yeah. that you've been arrested for other things, it makes it a little more difficult to sit down and even talk to you. Mm -hmm. It's not that we haven't wanted to. Yeah. Uh, but I do have counsel, and that's something that, you know, my attorney's always been a phone call away. Has, you, has your attorney ever told you that we would like to speak to you? And we had agreed, him and I together, that we would all sit down together, him and I, and you guys, and, you know, we entertain whatever questions you have and there is no possible way that a defense attorney would actually sit down and, as Casey states, entertain any question the police have for them. Yet if we weren't paying close attention, we would take her at her word due to the eloquence of her dialogue and not realize everything she's saying is complete nonsense. I actually thought that we made it pretty clear mm -hmm. that, you know, we wanted to talk to you. I mean, obviously, we can't come to you and ask you. Yeah, but, understandably. You know. I thought that you were aware that if you wanted to talk to, to anybody, mm -hmm. that all you got to do was simply ask. Yeah, well, I know it goes both ways on that, and I guess it would have needed to come from me. I should have been the one to, I guess, come forward with it. But, you know, we did open up that door to law enforcement before when Sergeant Allen was making a big deal saying, well, we want to talk to her. When can we talk to her? And he's saying, well, the door's open. I don't believe he ever told us the door was open. 
What's fascinating is how instinctive and confident her assertions are. In any other circumstance, or even without the knowledge we have now, you would have no reason not to believe everything she's saying. I've heard the words come out of his mouth, even myself, directed to other people that maybe didn't either relay the message or took it a different way, so I don't know. I think the lack of communication has put people in opposite corners when everybody has the same goal is to find Kaylee. We all still feel, I as a mom, I know in my gut there's the feeling as a parent, you know certain things about your child, you can feel that connection. And I still have that feeling, that presence. I know that she's alive. Whether you have a bucket load of evidence downstairs that contradicts that and says otherwise, or all you have is speculation, or or nothing at all. I mean, we had more than speculation. As every tip and, and that's every that lead follow up. Directly. Yeah. That we had more than speculation. We have a lot, or else we wouldn't be to this point. Mm -hmm. A lot. This was essentially a direct confrontation. The detective has just told Casey they have sufficient evidence to prove her guilt. Casey doesn't refute or even respond to the accusation. She instead falls back to her ridiculous dialogue once again, hoping the confidence in her voice will mask the absurdity of what she's actually saying. Well, I've said, I said the same thing to them. That, you know, they said that we're at the end of a hallway, and I'm thinking we're at the end of a hallway and there's two doors. Which door are we going to go through? or? I guess this is, you know, we're at this point, and... We are at this point. We're the, well the final beyond. step is which door is locked. We are well beyond where we were before. Mm -hmm. I mean, those, those issues are gone, okay? And when they refer to we're at the end of the hallway, I think you are know, well aware of what hallway we're talking about. Do you understand that? Um, well, so there's no question, I guess. You can specify that at this point what your perspective is on that. You have a second? Absolutely. Can we come right back? Yeah, that's fine. You plan on running off? I'm not going anywhere. I think I'll scratch out a little bit. I'm not as young as I used to be. <laughs> It's unfortunate that right when the pressure was starting to build, the second detective interrupts the exchange and they both leave the room soon after. Casey waits alone for roughly 40 minutes before her attorney shows up. He's here. So what we're going to try to do is give you a few minutes somewhere that's not recorded the detective now guilefully takes Casey up on her previous offer, where she insisted they were willing to sit down with police and answer questions. But first, I needed to, you to tell him, in your own words, if you will, that you'd like to take the opportunity to deal with us like you've made that request in the past. So, is that something you want to tell him? I told him the same thing we talked about before, that we would entertain any questions that they have. We would listen and discuss it, and if we have something to respond, we'll respond. It would come as no surprise that no conference was to be had. Casey was instead taken to the county jail, where she would remain for two and a half years awaiting trial. Those educated on Casey's past would assert that she was rarely sad, rarely angry, but always this bubbly and agreeable personality, even when it didn't suit the situation. The evidence put forward suggests that Casey was fake in every single setting and with every single person all of the time, a trait that might go unnoticed in everyday life, yet would clearly stand out when shown under the microscope of a criminal case study. Casey had become so accustomed to this fraudulent way of being that it even came as a natural behavior to her in the extraordinary setting we see here. And the assertion is that because Casey knew just how well she could fabricate this character, she thought she could use it to mask her anxiety and thus conceal guilty behavior. Casey, in all likelihood, had little to no regard for her daughter. That's not even an argument anymore. But her true temperament here would likely be far more apprehensive due to the concern over her own welfare. Every time the detective insinuated an accusation, Casey kept the same tone, same demeanor, and same confident, lighthearted disposition. If you took her out of this interrogative setting and placed her in the mall with her friends, it would seem completely normal. She would be faking her personality in both environments, yet we are only able to realize it in one. Casey, in a nutshell, was an inauthentic person long before she ever gave birth to her ill-fated daughter. On December 11, 2008, Kaylee's skeletal remains were discovered in a swamp less than a mile away from the Anthony household. She was wrapped in a Winnie the Pooh blanket and then placed in a canvas laundry bag. Duct tape was discovered around the nose and mouth area of the skull, and her death was ruled a homicide. 
Prosecutors in the case then announced they would be seeking the death penalty. On the last day Kaylee was seen alive by anyone other than her mother, and the day many believed she was murdered, Casey Anthony made the following internet searches. Jesus. At 7.54 p.m. that same evening, Casey and her boyfriend Tony were seen in a blockbuster video store. Kaylee was nowhere in sight. In the following weeks, Casey went out partying most nights. Just three days after her daughter's supposed abduction, she was captured in various photos participating in a hot body contest. Twelve days after, she got a tattoo on her back saying, Bella Vita, an Italian motto that translates, beautiful life. She also made an entry in her diary around the same time which read, I completely trust my own judgment and I knew that I made the right decision. This is the happiest that I have been in a very long time. I hope that my happiness will continue to grow. The trial commenced on May 24, 2011. The gist of the prosecution's argument was that Casey suffocated her daughter with duct tape and then placed her in the trunk for a few days before disposing of her body in the swamp. The motive for the murder was the primary focus during their opening statement. This isn't just a case about Casey Marie Anthony. It's a story about Kaylee Anthony as well. Although there was a lack of direct physical evidence tying the defendant to her daughter's death, the evidence the state actually had still seemed overwhelming. The defense, on the other hand, were up against it. So not only did they use charm and appeal to sway the jury's attention away from the evidence, they dropped an absolute bombshell in their opening statements to create as much doubt as humanly possible. Kaylee Anthony died on June 16, 2008, when she drowned in her family's swimming pool. After Kaylee died, Casey did what she's been doing all her life, or for most of it, hiding her pain. Going into that dark corner and pretending that she does not live in, in the situation that she's living in. When Casey was eight years old and her father came into her room and began to touch her inappropriately. Jeez. This child at eight years old, learn to lie immediately. The trial would go on to last six weeks, with the prosecution exposing the truly dark and deceptive nature of Casey's character. While the state relied on fact, the defense clung on to theory and proposed every conspiracy under the sun in the hope they would create enough skepticism and confusion. One of the more noted details of the trial was the courtroom presence of Jose Baez. He had an exceptional ability of narrative control and storytelling. Closing arguments were put forward on Sunday the 3rd of July. When you have a child, that child becomes your life. <clears throat> This case is about the clash between that responsibility and the expectations that go with it and the life that Casey Anthony wanted to have. Casey meets Tony. Tony has this life. He's free. He's a club promoter. He's out there at night with the loud music and dancing, and it's a great free life so she has a choice at the end of the day when everything is said and done the one question will never be answered the key question in this case will never be answered it can never be proven and that is how did Kaylee die I'm going to start with my biggest fear I'm going to tell you right up front what I fear may happen in this case. Is that you I don't know, like so... I feel about it and explain why I feel it. This case deals with so much emotion. I know that there were times where every single person in here felt something deep down inside. Your rules of deliberation, what the law is, is that this case must not be decided for or against anyone because you feel sorry for anyone or are angry at anyone. You'll notice that Mr. Baez locks the jury's focus on this while subtly concealing this. He presents the argument that the prosecution has purposely got the jury emotionally invested in the case in the hope it would push them towards a guilty verdict. Yet in this exact same statement, he himself is getting them emotionally invested for the exact opposite reason. While refuting the prosecution's supposed attempt to entice anger, he subtly attempts to evoke empathy. 
Say what you want about this attorney and the ethics of his conduct, but what you are about to witness is expertly done, and what many believe to be what saved Casey Anthony's life. And that's because, obviously, we want you to base your verdict on the evidence, not on emotion. And it's my biggest fear because it's such a difficult thing for you to push aside. Kaylee Anthony was a beautiful, sweet, innocent child died far too soon. There's no doubt about it, and that is not disputed by anyone. But to parade her up here to invoke your emotion would be improper. It's improper under the law, and it's improper as to the rules of your deliberation. He went on for a great... This guy on some Robert Kardashian shit. Come on. ...great length of time talking about this beautiful child. Not on his evidence, not on the evidence that was presented before you. It was to set up the emotion for what was to come. And that is exactly how this case was presented. You, they didn't come right out the gate and show you the evidence. They gave you two weeks of testimony that was completely irrelevant and served only one purpose. And that was to paint Casey Anthony as a slut as a party girl, as a girl who lies, and has absolutely nothing to do with how Kaylee died. And this prosecution was geared in such a manner that it was deliberate, it was methodical, it was thorough, and it was detailed. Mr. Baez then focuses on the fact that the state has the burden of proof, and thereafter continues to intertwine the two essential features of his argument, empathy and doubt. Don't speculate. Don't guess. It has to be proven to you beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. If you don't know what happened, it wasn't proven. We don't want you to tell us what you think happened. We want you to tell us what was proven happened. As to the charge of first degree murder, verdict as to count one, we the jury find the defendant not guilty, so say we all, dated at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, on this fifth day of July, 2011, signed for person. As to the charge of aggravated child abuse, verdict as to count two, we the jury find the defendant not guilty. Jesus. So say we all, did it at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, this fifth day of July, 2011, signed for person. As to the charge of aggravated manslaughter of a child, verdict as to count three, we the jury find the defendant not guilty, so say we all, dated at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, this fifth day of July, 2011, signed for person. And juror number 12, were these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Thank you. Remember to hit that like and subscribe, and don't forget the notification bell so that my videos show up right in your feed.